thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Byline Festival. My name is Oz Katherji. I'm freelance. Mostly I've been covering Syria for the last few years, uh, which obviously has led me to deal with a lot of Russian misinformation. And uh, Russia is the topic of conversation today, and more specifically, Vladimir Putin, the man, the myth, the monster. And uh, joining me on this panel today, we've got uh, Zarina Zabriskie. Uh, she's a writer of uh, short stories and novels, and she's an investigative journalist who's been focusing a lot on Trump Russia recently, and she's based in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Oliver Buller, who's an author and a journalist. Uh, he's got a book called Moneyland, which is about dirty money. That's due out next month in a couple weeks. Available in all good bookshops. <laughs> Uh, we have the man who needs no introduction, Mr. John Sweeney over here, a uh, BBC journalist who uh, drives fear into the hearts of tyrants wherever he goes. They simply cannot be interviewed by him. Uh, they refuse to. John Cleese is over there. <laughs> I'm Manuel. So, uh, yes. And, uh, and then we have Luke Harding, who is uh, The Guardian's former Moscow correspondent and the author of three books on Russia. Again, we have a who's who of people that Vladimir Putin hates right here, so hopefully we should get a bit of a, a good conversation going. So I'm gonna start with you, Zarina. Well, hi, and thanks for being here. Many thanks to the Byline Festival organizers who invited such a great panel. I think it's a really good way to start putting together a strategy that the West, frankly, needs really badly uh, to confront the situation in the world at this point. I grew up in St. Petersburg, Russia, which some of you might know is the birth town of Putin as well, and crossed paths with him indirectly many times throughout my time there. I left about 20 years ago. I actually can go two directions. I can either give you in a nutshell what I think happened to Russia, what mafia state is, and how it affects us, or I can give you a lot of details on Putin's backgrounds, his grandfather, his father, and such. So since we decided it would be a little bit more informal, uh, maybe some audience participation, people who want to hear uh, my view of a mafia state in a nutshell, raise your hands. Okay, and people decided. who want to hear some interesting, intriguing details about Putin's background. Yeah. Oh. Less so. I think we know the answer there. So both. Yeah. Oh, uh, we could do that, but I don't want to like grab the time. So Start we can with the mafia state and then tack okay. on some Let's Putin. Let's do briefly the mafia the state, and I'm sure other people have a lot to offer on that subject as well. So basically, in the last 27 years or so, Russia has been ruled by the conglomerate of criminal individuals and organizations. This conglomerate includes several groups. I'm going to list them. One of them is so-called oligarchs, or people who, by legal means, got the rights to run and exploit uh, large corporations, state-owned corporations, that generally speaking exploit natural resources that they stole from the Russian people. The second group are so-called siloviki, or the structures of military and secret service natures. That includes police, law enforcement, uh, the former KGB, now known as FSB, and so forth. Number three group that is often overlooked is the Russian Orthodox Church, which is joining in uh, into this conglomerate, and also organized crime. And at this point, uh, these structures are really fused together. So this conglomerate, as I mentioned before, exploits their natural resources and siphons the money out of Russia using the structures of uh, shell companies uh, and front companies sh uh, shipping it offshore. And I know one of my colleagues is going to cover that in detail. So the money is being shipped and siphoned to the uh, offshore areas with minimum transparency like Cayman Islands and British Virgin Islands and Cyprus, and from there to the US, which is the biggest hub for laundering money, and the UK. In the US, it's Delaware and Wisconsin, the states where we have the least transparency as well. 
From there, anonymously, money is being invested into the real estate mainly, but also into the luxury items, anywhere from yacht and uh, paintings by famous artists and occasionally sports teams. And what is important, and again, often overlooked, the hybrid war. Now, why hybrid war? Why does this mafia state need the hybrid war against the West and against its own people? The main reason is because it needs to stay in power. That's their main political goal, to keep the power and to transfer it to its own children or to keep it in the family. That's number one political goal. Then there is economic goal, and that's basically keeping the West as its uh, safety deposit bank where the uh, oligarchs and the corporation and the con conglomerate keeps the money in the Western banks. And it also needs the West to sell the natural goods to produce this income. And then importantly, there is the ideological level that most people, well, not most people, but often gets overlooked because it doesn't seem as important. And here comes a trick. There's no really an ideology to the mafia state. Whatever ideology there is, it's simulacra. It's a fake ideology. Putin came up with the idea of uh, patriotism as uh, Russian new ideology in the early 2000s. And then it was developed by so-called political technologists. It's a profession that exists in Russia. And that includes the main brain of Putin, du Alexander Dugin, of Vladislav Surkov, and so forth. And for that, they use the propaganda, a very well-developed um, organ or the arm that reaches into the mind of the people. And that's the whole other topic that I'm not going into. Uh, but when the propaganda fails, they uh, revert to the traditional warfare uh, methods. And right now we know they are actually cutting Ukrainian access to the Azov Sea, which the action that is not being covered that widely in the press, by the way. Uh, so that is also on the table. And so what I think we here can do, bring together the uh, thinkers, uh, philosophers, sociologists, historians, psychologists, and figure out what we can do having this picture in mind to confront the situation. And if we don't do it, if we overlook that whole process that has been happening for the last almost 30 years, uh, we are facing the whole other world order, post-Western U order, as uh, the foreign minister of Russia puts it. Puts it. And um, from here, I'll pass it. Thank you very much, Serena. I'm sorry we didn't get to hear about Putin's grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> There's time, there's time. Yeah, there's still time. <laughs> still time for his granny. I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I want to give lots of time for you guys to ask questions, and it's good to see all of you here. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how we, we, not us here specifically, but we, the West, sort of created Putin. Um, Putin, the, not necessarily the man as such, but the institution of Putin and the Kremlin machine that he oversees is a, is a profoundly sort of 21st century thing. I mean, he may look like a kind of 19th century thug and, you know, and, and sort of Eastern European tyrant, but, but he is, you know, very skilled and very gifted at exploiting the 21st century financial system and the way that, that it allows him to seamlessly move money um, from country to country undetected um, and, and by influence and by assets, by property, um, as and how he wishes. And this is, I think, something that doesn't get as much attention as it should, and, and I don't think we are as alarmed as we should be about the potential that he has to really sow disorder and, and, and chaos if he wants to. Um, there's, I've just been reading uh, Adam Tooze's book, um, uh, Crashed, which I highly recommend. It comes out next month. I'm reviewing it. It's amazing. But it's this moment in 2008 during the, the, the height of the financial crisis when the Russians rang up the Chinese and said, hey, let's dump a load of US securities because wouldn't that be fun? Um, and it's that level of, of essentially gaming the international system and the way that the international system sets, is set up is essentially it's based on trust that everyone will have access to you know the globalized system because everyone wants to get rich together but if one player doesn't particularly care about whether his country gets rich and instead wants to screw up everyone else's country then the whole system becomes not a source of strength but a source of great vulnerability um, and the amount of Russian money out there is, is really extraordinary um, the best estimate from Gabriel Zuckman who's an academic who studies this is that 52% of all the Russian household wealth is held offshore. 
um, more than half of all the money in the country is out there somewhere held an anonymously via structures in, in, in the British Virgin Islands holding property in London and property in New York and property in Miami and so on. It is a genuinely alarming amount of money and Putin's potential to spread chaos if he wants to is something that we, we're not nearly as aware of as we should be and that's the thing that I'm really keen to focus on. Thank you very much, sir. Vladimir Putin, what's not to like? He's a great guy. You're wrong, you're wrong. Listen, I am sick and tired of, 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 of batting the wrong side. If I was at the Valdai conference right now, if I was in the Kremlin, the bloody room would have walls, wouldn't it? And it we, we wouldn't, and the weather would be nice, uh, he would have done something with the weather, you know, you'd all be paid, uh, and everything like that. And there'd be, you know, and there'd be Peter Mandelson over there, Seamus Mill, hello Seamus, you're very important these days. And, and you know, what are we doing? Uh, we're stuck here with a bunch of losers, and, and, uh, and John Cleese is on shortly. <laughs> That's actually not what I think. Um, I actually think that the other people are a bunch of losers, and some of them are murderers. So let's just think about um, um, the people I dedicated my novel on Amazon. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that. It's called Cold, and uh, not very many people read it, but it's, 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 ab it's about Russia, and it's about my love affair with Russia. I did, um, um, unlike Seamus Mill, a man I greatly admire, um, uh, uh, he went to Winchester College, which I believe is a, uh, uh, it costs money to go there. And I went to somewhere called Barton Peril Grammar School, which is in Eastleigh, six miles down the road. Um, but that's, that's not important right now. Uh, the, uh, the, anyway, uh, what is important is um, that Seamus has actually done a Valdai gig, and Vladimir Putin was, was he was chairing the event, and Vladimir Putin was there. So this is the opposite. It feels so much better being here. Um, but I dedicated coal to three people who I'd met, and all of whom were critical of Vladimir Putin. One was um, um, Anna Politovskaya, I'm, I'm almost certainly pronounced that wrong. Um, uh, Polit uh, anyway, there you are, the, uh, this guy knows how to pronounce her name. Um, but she was good fun and feisty, and she was critical of Vladimir Putin, and she was shot dead. And the next um, was a, a wonderful and brave woman who reported fundamentally upon the war in Chechnya and, her na and, and the victims of that. Her name was na na Natasha Estimirova. Estimirova. Uh, <laughs> and Natasha, <laughs> there's a consistency here, but anyway, and these people do, do exist. And she was a critic of Putin and she was shot dead too. And the third, Boris Nemtsov. Correct, thank you. Uh, I don't get everything wrong. Um, oh, by the way, uh, I work for the BBC, but these are not the BBC. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, Boris Nemtsov was fantastic and very, very funny. So we sat down, and I'd um, just, I was doing a panorama. It's on, available on YouTube. It's called Putin's Games. And it's um, about um, what's happening in Sochi and the corruption and all the nonsense of the building, uh, the Sochi Olympics. And uh, Nemtsov said, for example, to build the road between uh, the coast, the sea resort, and the, uh, the ski resort, it cost $5 billion. And Nemtsov said it would have been cheaper to have paved this road with Louis Vuitton handbags. <laughs> it was a tremendous whip, real fun. And um, a, a question for the uh, hated liberal mainstream media, such as ourselves, is what, what would, um, how welcome will um, gay Olympians be in Sochi, bearing in mind Russia's, uh, frankly, um, dinosaur approach to homosexuality? And I interviewed the mayor of Sochi, a Putinist, and he said, there are, uh, and I said, uh, you know, how will gays be treated um, for the Sochi Olympics? And he said, there are no gays in Sochi. And, and I said, well, that's strange, because I went to a gay bar last night. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, why the producer dragged me to that place, I don't know. Actually, I know exactly why, <laughs> to ask the story of the mayor. And, um, and then I, anyway, I interviewed Nemtsov, and, um, and, and, I, and I said, and the mayor of Sochi said, there are no gays in Sochi. And Nemtsov said, what? He said, what? There are no gays? And he laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. It was tremendous. Um, energy, like a wave of laughter. He was a fantastic lover of the absurd 
and then he was shot dead a uh, hundred meters from the Kremlin. And um, recently, I, I did a panorama called "Taking on Putin," and, um, and I, I, I dedicated uh, my novel to this guy and, and the others. And and I was uh, detained and accused by the Kremlin media of desecrating a shrine to Boris Nemtsov. Now, I would never do that, and that gives you some scale of the dishonesty of the lie factory that is the Kremlin. And it upsets me deeply that there are senior politicians in the West, in this country, who on a regular basis give the Kremlin the benefit of the doubt. You know who I'm talking about, but I've gone on too much. You're next. Thank you very much, John. Um, John, just before uh, I start, who, who, who do you mean precisely? Uh, well, okay. Uh, after after the Skripal poisoning, now, uh, I, okay, uh, has Russia got a history? Uh, just a brief answer. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, like if, 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 you, if you want a brief answer, get the Kremlin to pay for you. Uh, uh, okay. Well, uh, if the history of politi uh, Russian political assassination, should we start with Trotsky? <laughs> uh, actually, we can go further back, go further than, back no. than that, can't yeah. we? Okay. Anyway, so the point is, yes, it was Jeremy Corbyn who said, after the Skripal poisonings, that we should put further evidence of that. And it struck me that that was strange, because there is strong evidence that the, Russians, that the Russian state assassinates its opponents. Skripal was an opponent, he's seen by the GRU as a traitor. And to give the Russian state the benefit of the doubt on this seemed to me strange. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so yeah, well, hi everybody. Um, it's it's great to be here um, uh, I, I, again. And can I just salute Peter Jukes on the left hand side? Yeah. Yeah. All this. Yeah. This, this is very much his first one, his baby, and it's it's going to be fantastic. Okay, it's going to be big, Peter. It's going to be big. Um, so j huge. Um, balls next time. <laughs> Beautiful. So, balls. The next comes on paper. Um, so just just to pick up John's uh, theme of political murder, I mean I think that's right. I think that's that's one of kind of Putin's hallmarks. It's not unique to Putin. This was, as John was saying, this was something that the, the Soviet state did with with Trotsky and with with Ukrainian nationalists being blown up and poisoned in the 1930s. But I think what, what's been kind of interesting, and this is something I follow, both as a Moscow correspondent for the Guardian between 2007 and 2011, and also subsequently back from the UK, is is the return of, of murder as a sort of political instrument. So we have the Skripals, um, we have, we reported in the Guardian a story a couple of weeks ago that, that apparently the um, police have identified two suspects who it appears flew in from Moscow and flew out again on the weekend of, of the kind of Novichok attack. But what, what, what struck me about the Skripal case is actually we've been here before. I wrote a book about Alexander Litvinenko called A Very Expensive Poison. And that was another um, exotic uh, an extraordinary political murder that I followed uh, initially in Moscow where I kind of interviewed the two killers, Dmitry Kofton and Andrei Lugovoy. They and deny they, it. They, well, they, they deny it, uh, but they did it. Uh, and <laughs> I can say that because there's been a public inquiry finding which we got in 2016, which found them guilty of murder. But, but, but not just that. Um, uh, and what was fascinating about, about this public inquiry, which I covered for The Guardian, was that we got thousands of pages of evidence. We got witness statements from uh, numerous people, some of whom were dead by this point, including Boris Berezovsky. But we, we got a kind of, it was the most sort of forensically detailed murder in British criminal history. Second by second, step by step, we could trace these two killers around London as they left this kind of billowing trail of radiation, which culminated with them putting polonium, uh, lethal polonium in a, in, a, in a cup of green tea, which Litvinenko drank and died in agony 22, years, uh, 22 days later. And you know, we, we learned many things from the inquiry. We learned that the assassin sent by Moscow was sometimes not very good. Uh, the, these two killers took three attempts to poison Livinenko. Um, uh, when they failed on the first day, they, they tipped the, the polonium uh, down the U-bend of their hotel bathroom. Uh, and if it had been a movie, they would have then called Moscow and sort of said, look, you know, we, we have failed, what do we do? And in fact, they got one of those NAF cycle rickshaws and were peddled by a Polish guy around Soho. Um, and they went to an erotic 
nightclub, which some of you may know in German Street, uh, where, where they failed to score, um, <laughs> even though it was basically a brothel. And we, 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 know, we know all this from the, the Polonium and forensic readings, which were presented in evidence. So this whole story is terrible, uh, but there's also a kind of grim, macabre comic element to it. But I mean, I think the sort of serious point, as, as well as these gangsters who are, who are cruising around the UK doing doing murder, um, is that the, the, the judge in this case, Robert Owen, found in his report that this operation had probably been approved by Vladimir Putin. So in other words, it's not, as John, John says, it's not the hated liberal mainstream media conspiring against Moscow and its government. This is now a juridical fact that Putin probably murders people he doesn't like. Um, and, and just briefly, I would say, as well as the political murder, we have really, I would say, quite a successful and a chilling problem, project ongoing uh, featuring the US election of 2016 to, to reshape the world in Russia's favor. And what, what Putin is doing is he is quite smartly um, exploiting social media, Facebook and Twitter, and he's exploiting the fissures and divisions in our own society here in the UK, in Europe, in the States. He's sort of putting paraffin, accelerant, um, on these issues because ultimately the goal is to subvert Western democracy, to instrumentalize the far left and the far right, uh, in this country and elsewhere, um, and to, to squash the kind of the, the, the reasonable moderate center and to um, inculcate what I would say is a kind of mood of universal cynicism where you don't actually have to believe what Russia says about Skripal or, or about the US election. You just have to not really believe anything. So the truth is, is obscured and, and occluded. And the Russian state has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on, on Russia Today, on Sputnik, on classical espionage, on cyber hacking. Um, and, and the goal really is, is nihilistic. I mean, Putin is the world's nihilist in chief. Um, so, so we actually no longer kind of have any faith in elected institutions or politicians. We think they're all as bad as each other. And, and then Russia can do its kind of fell sovereign thing without anybody noticing or challenging. And I think we live in precarious times. Uh, I think we need to interrogate these times. And I think we also need to have a kind of spirit of, of enlightenment and, and civic activism, which is why I'm so glad to see so many of you here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, all very interesting. Uh, if we had more time, I wish I could throw in my two cents about how Syria ties into all of this, how Vladimir Putin created refugees by bombing hospitals and schools and then started investing money in the far right to use these refu refugees and weaponize them against the West, which has led to Brexit, it's led to the rise in the far right in Germany, in Sweden, in France, uh, in Italy, uh, and also um, how that's tied in with uh, first the Obama administration and then moving on to Trump. You know. Putin has his fingers in many pies, and I don't know if many of you saw this, but three Russian journalists were killed um, in Africa uh, a couple of weeks ago as well. They were they were um, investigating uh, how Vladimir Putin is is investing more money, more military resources into conflicts across Africa now um, with his a group they're called the Wagner uh, PMC, private military contractor. Um, they're in Syria, they're in Ukraine. Um, it's a way of Putin sending troops abroad without, with plausible deniability. Um, and I, I thank all of our panelists here because they, they gave us warm memories of, um, of people that are no longer with us. And, and we can have a laugh and remember them. And, and I can have a laugh and remember my friends that have been killed in, a, in action in Syria. Um, but I think what's important to remember is these, these people weren't just, they didn't just die. They, they were murdered, and they were murdered because they got in the way of Vladimir Putin. These people weren't violent men or women. These people weren't, you know, terrorists. These people were journalists, human rights activists. And if any of these people were, were British born and killed by the British government, we would never hear the end of it. We would overthrow our government for something like that. But when it comes to Vladimir Putin, we still have our own politicians who are saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't be sanctioning Vladimir Putin's top men, you know? So again, hopefully we can use this now as a, as a, as a means. We know what the problem is, we've identified it. What can we do about it? My first question to the panel would be, what is the Magnitsky Act? And uh, is it the greatest fear that Vladimir Putin has? And I'll start with you, Luke. Um, 
Well, uh, the, I mean, I think th there's a kind of challenge for, for Western policymakers and uh, for, for politicians, which is how do you respond to a powerful, uh, rogue, I would say, nuclear armed state that is prepared to use um, overwhelming military forces we saw in Georgia in 2008 and Ukraine in 2014 to uh, achieve its geopolitical objectives. Now, nobody wants an apocalypse, no one wants a third world war, but as, as uh, um, the other panelists were saying, I mean, the, the, the kind of Achilles heel for the Putin regime is that the people at the top of it, they're all billionaires and their money is not in Moscow, their money is offshore. And very often, um, it's actually in this country. Um, uh, uh, Oliver's done some tremendous work on this and we'll talk about it. Um, and uh, the thing is, if, if you are worth $5 billion and you can no longer float in the Mediterranean on your super yacht with your mistress, or, or go and eat cuttlefish in Corsica, or go to Paris, or come to London, or whatever, that's actually, that's a great indignity. Um, and so visa bans, asset freezes, withdrawing access to dollar-denominated accounts are definitely the way to go. Not, not because Russia is in any way the enemy, because I think we have to be very clear that th this is not against Russians, because the Russians are the victims here. Um, it, it's against the people at the top who basically are kleptocrats. They're, they're some of the richest people on the planet. And actually, um, sanctions, targeted sanctions, I think is, is, is very powerful, and it's, it's the best instrument in the, the UK, because it's such an attractive regime four wealthy Russians should really be leading the way on this. Uh, 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 briefly, because uh, Oliver knows much more about this um, than I do, but uh, one of the things is we've got to get on with the, with the Russians, which means the Kremlin, because otherwise there could be a third world war. Vladimir Putin and Oleg Deripaska and the rest do not want a third world war, because if there is a third world war, then there would be nowhere to park their yachts. In the, we have provided in the West, and in particular in the United Kingdom, the mechanisms by which they can hide their dirty money. And Oliver will now explain all of those mechanisms in a sentence. Thank you very much, John. No pressure. <laughs> I'm not going to explain those mechanisms because, um, you know, I don't want to give you all the advice. I don't want to explain those mechanisms because you might start using them. But the problem with the mechanisms that the Russians use to hide their dirty money is they are the same mechanisms that our own native tax dodgers use yeah. to hide their naughty money. And so the problem is not just that we have to confront Vladimir Putin and Deripaska and all that. We also have to confront our own very wealthy elites, particularly in this country in the United States. And that is a rather different matter and rather more problematic. Um, and the reason why it is so difficult to confront Putin and the bigger Putin is because that also involves confronting quite a lot of very wealthy political donors, um, which is a much more troubling prospect. And it, because without that cover, without wealthy Westerners essentially running interference for them, not wanting to have their own anonymity interfered with, the Russians really wouldn't be that fearsome a foe. The economy of Russia is about the same size as the economy of Spain or of Texas. It's not that big. Um, there isn't that much money on a, on a sort of geopolitical scale of things. Um, but annoyingly, there are a lot of people that benefit from the same tricks that Putin benefits from. And so it's the, the, the challenge that we all face um, who believe in democracy and the rule of law is that we need to confront our own wealthy people while we're confronting the Russian wealthy people. And that is not right. Thank you very much, Oliver. So I think you guys pretty much covered it, but I just want to add from coming from the United States that one of the main uh, points on agenda of uh, electing Trump for Russia, one of the main interests was uh, stopping the sanctions and they cared about it enough to send Natalia Viselnitskaya uh, to talk to Trump Jr. and risking a lot by this meeting uh, to negotiate Magnitsky Act, which was called adoption. And uh, um, uh, even now, if you follow up uh, the Russian entries um, on Twitter, talking kind of on behalf of the Kremlin, which they always do, they kind of do and they kind of not, but they say, well, if you do not, if you cannot stop the sanctions, at least do not impose them, hold on, linger there, and we'll do something in between. Basically, because freezing their assets is like cutting them off oxygen. They won't be able to continue. We'll cut the vicious circle if we cut off their money and if we will not allow them to send their families here, to send their children here, to have their assets 
parked, like you said, in our quarter. So that's pretty clear. Just to, I mean, on, on the note of, of that, the, the um, after 2008, there was quite a concerted effort among Western countries to stop Switzerland hiding money. Um, and it was quite successful. Um, UBS was forced to back down Credit Suisse, and Switzerland was sort of broken open as a center of banking secrecy. The response to that, though, was very interesting. Since then, the amount of assets booked in South Dakota has increased 20-fold. Um, the amount of assets in Nevada, they don't publish the figures, but probably by about the same. Um, now the place where, if you're a wealthy Russian, or more troublingly wealthy Chinese, because there's much more Chinese money um, acting in a very similar way, the place you put it now is Nevada or, or South Dakota or Wyoming or, or Delaware. And they specifically advertise themselves in, in these places. Their trust management companies specifically advertise themselves saying, look, if you put your money here, you're safe from the US Treasury. Um, you know, we cannot be bullied in the way that Cyprus or Switzerland can be bullied. And, and it's really a very worrying development, frankly, that the idea that America has turned into the world's biggest tax haven now, and how on earth can you bully America into releasing this money in the way that you could bully Switzerland? So it's a, yeah, it's, it's a pretty parlous state of affairs. Donald Trump's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't know about you, but I for one am shocked to find out Switzerland has been hiding dirty money from tyrants. Shocked and appalled, I tell you. Um, okay, so we've covered Magnitsky, I think. Uh, my next question, I'm going to throw one more out there, and then we're going to throw open to some questions from the audience. Um, so Vladimir Putin has a very uh, interesting uh, reciprocal relationship with the far right, uh, both within Russia and uh, within the West. Um, I would like, I'm going to start with Zarina, because this is uh, where she's been heading towards recently with her. But how does Putin use the far right, and what is his plans for weaponizing the far right, as it were, within the West, within America, within Western Europe? Well, um, thanks for that. And then I want to advertise my next panel. Come uh, at 10 o'clock on Sunday to one of the lovely tents, and I will be covering the far right uh, with one of the best specialists on the topic, James Patrick and Carolyn Orr um, in Old Reich at 10 o'clock on Sunday, in depth. Uh, but. Um, uh, uh, here, instead of going into the depths, in-depth analysis, I want to bring in some personal anecdotes because I'm based in Berkeley and uh, 2017 turned out to be uh, like a very neo-Nazi uh, year for us. Uh, I live like two blocks away from a park that used to be called Martin Luther King Park and it was renamed into neo-Nazi park because we basically had uh, hordes of Nazis marching in with their um, all sort of uh, symbols and all sort of slogans. Uh, and we had clashes between Antifa and uh, the all sorts of alt-right parts. And that gave me a chance to report uh, there was very little national coverage of these events. So I did the best I could with the photo reportages and even talking to these people, although that's pretty hard. They, they were uh, asking for the freedom of speech, but they basically can't speak, given a chance. There's not much they can produce into the microphone. Um, it was interesting to follow up uh, the, uh, what was happening with Antifa, the uh, controversial, uh, not a movement organization, but the loose a uh, group, I should say, of people who are against fascism, anti-fascist, they were turned basically by the Russian media into uh, an evil force and uh, the narrative was flipped, so they became the fascists. And it was fascinating to watch how it was happening. Um, and I had quite a few investigations on Twitter and on social media where uh, I had a chance to follow up the memes that they were coming up with, uh, showing the uh, ladies who were beaten up and uh, badly injured by the Antifa members and anti-fascists, like uh, coming with punch and Nazi slogans, and it was all blamed on Antifa, while well, in fairness, it was prepared somewhere in the Russian um, tr troll factory back in St. Petersburg and Olgina or whatnot. And it, it was all traced uh, on media. So basically, it was very clear that Russia supports uh, the alt right movements of all sorts in the States. And later, through my research, I found out 
in Europe as well. And there is a lot of connections on the highest level of this hierarchy. Alexander Dugin is connected with David Duke, uh, who is the major figure of Ku Klux Klan in America, and uh, some Texan separatists living in his apartment and so on and so forth. So you go in there and you see this whole spider network of connections. And of course, a lot of money that goes into that from the Kremlin. And uh, I will go more in depth on it on Sunday. Thank you very much. Okay. I mean, I think the, the, the thing to remember is that, that any cause that separates Western countries and stops them working together is a cause that Putin approves of. Um, because for the simple sort of strategic reason that his money is international and yet we are national and anything that stops us acting internationally is in his favor. Um, and, and in that regard, I mean, I, I think that it's one of the reasons I think that, that Brexit is so sad um, because actually the EU was getting quite good at coordinating its actions in, in combating transnational organized crime and transnational financial crime. Um, and anything that stops that happening is, is, is bad. So, um, I mean, these causes, the, the far right, the far left, this is all part of that drive essentially to fragment the world. And once the world is fragmented, it makes it much easier for rich people who, are, who, who live transnationally to, to remain rich and transnational. John? Adolf Hitler. He's a great guy. <laughs> if you're beginning to pick up the uh, theme here, uh, well done, you were a smarty. Um, another thing I'm pissed off about, I wasn't invited to the Austrian foreign minister's wedding. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, what's that to like? A bunch of Nazis and there's Vladimir Putin. Fantastic. I, what distresses me is that... Um, um, my father's, my mother and father's generation, my father was in the Battle of Atlantic uh, and, and they fought the Nazis and they won, but it feels like they're, 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 they're doing rather well in injury time. Um, I'm uh, concerned that um, this stuff is, is becoming more and more powerful. And because I work for the BBC, and these are not the views of the BBC, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you have to, every now and then, I say, well, can I say they're a fascist? And they say, no, you can't say they're a fascist. Salvini, can I say he's a fascist? No, you can't. Because he's, he's not actually endorsing the fascist thing, and also, and there's a history point as well, which I get and understand, that fascism and Nazism in particular was a, a particular moment in history, and you've got to be precise about that, and you shouldn't undermine the currency of language. And at the same time, I managed to slip into a, uh, a member of the league, uh, a league supporter in um, somewhere down south in Italy. I managed to say, but some people say he's a bit of a fascist. <laughs> um, 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 and these are questions that were always on the periphery of politics, on the periphery. Do I pronounce that right? Fuck off. Um, <laughs> sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I knew I was going to get my own back. It was just it was delayed. Anyway, uh, all right. Fight with someone, maybe. I'm not going to fight. I don't know what happened. Sorry, this is the liberal it's mainstream media. It's not the BBC, anyway, We're your friends, John. We're your friends. <laughs> so you say. Um, anyway, uh, the point is that these questions used to be on the edge of normal political discourse across the Western world. And now, in places like Italy and Austria, they're not. This is concerning. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree with my good friend John here, uh, to my left, fa fan of Adolf, fan of Donald. Um, uh, fan of Vladimir. Um, uh, and I, I, think, I think it really is a sort of sinister project, because actually, the people at the top of the Kremlin are probably socially pretty liberal. They don't really hate gay people. They're always hiring Elton John to fly and, and, and play, play at their, their daughter's wedding and Elton John gets half a million dollars for it. So sort of socially they're tolerant, but th th this uh, ideology, which as Oliver said, is kind of relatively new, uh, um, has, has been elevated uh, where, where essentially it's white, it's ethno-nationalist, it's conservative, um, it's orthodox with a capital O, um, and, and Putin increasingly, uh, as we see these governments, as you say, in Italy and elsewhere, swinging um, far right, is being projected as the, as the sort of global conservative leader of, of, of this movement. And um, I think it's very, very um, troubling. And also, I mean, you, you were talking about useful idiots. There are plenty of useful idiots on, on, on the far right as well. We have people like Nick Griffin going to Crimea, uh, we have the AFD, we have uh, French ultra-right people um, who are being uh, sort of
bust into kind of a firm Russian uh, elections. And, and what we're looking at is we're looking at soft power, we're looking at networking, um, and we're looking um, at definitely trying to undermine the European Union um, but by, by, by fueling these kind of corrosive forces. So uh, I think it's very dangerous. Uh, and, and I really would have loved to have seen you, John, at the Austrian uh, <laughs> wedding. I would have paid good, good money for that. So um, some interesting points raised here. I think the uh, lack of ideology is a, is a really interesting one and the weaponization of the far right and the weaponization of, of media. Um, I'll give one example in my own life. Uh, you were talking about how Antifa were labelled by the Russian media as being a bad thing. I have a long history, I don't know if any of you know my work, but I have a long history of anti-fascist campaigning. And uh, some, um, there's this, I call him a journalist, a weird blogger, that was actually fighting with uh, Russian separatists in the Donbass. Uh, he put a blog post up about me trawling through my Facebook. Um, and there's a photo of me carrying an anti-fascist flag, and he said that I was an Antifa fascist uh, who was being funded by George Soros uh, to sell the organs of refugees on the black market. With no evidence, just from photos of me on my Facebook. It's with, clearly true. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, I was just a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you for that loving interjection there, uh, uh, Mr. Sweeney. Um, but I, I think you see the point is that actually there there is no real driving ideology behind Putin supporting the far right or the far left. Is that these people play a role for him um, in in just oh well the West is bad let's focus on on Western liberal democracy let's focus on Western liberal media attack that oh it doesn't matter if the fascists or whatever just just the problem is the West it's the liberals it's the you know uh, it's it's about targeting what we have as, as, as globalization, as international power structures, human rights. If you erode all of these away, suddenly the, the ones that are in the ascendancy are the ones that don't care about these things. And, you know, it's not like the West is free of problems. We, we have Western governments that are responsible for corruption and, and war crimes and so on. But in the West, you can't go up and say, yeah, I believe we should kill all these people. Whereas, you know, or sometimes you can, you've got Nick Griffins and so on and so forth. But, you know, it isn't weaponized in the way that, that Putin weaponizes them, and, and he seems to be invested in enabling these voices and, uh, and giving them a platform. And by doing so, he's undermining Western liberal democracy, and he's not undermining the structure of Russia, because he rules Russia with an iron grip, and you know, trade unionists in Russia end up in prison or end up shot dead. Liberal journalists end up shot dead. You know, there's, there's, that's how it works here. So. There's, there's one rule in Russia and there's, there's one rule in the West. And I think that many of the people that are used by Russia today in Russian state media um, know this and they have no interest in what's going on in Russia. They are using this soft power platform, as you said, to undermine Western institutions with little care for what it, what it actually entails and, and how that actually plays out. And how it plays out, as we see, is a Trump victory in America and Brexit and so on and so forth. So, right, I'm going to open some questions out to the audience. Um, our lovely producer here is going to pass them over. So um, I will take the bearded man with the glasses who was first up. Uh, this lovely lady over here. Uh, um, okay. And the man with the hat and this lady over here. Is that okay? Right. I'm gonna ask them all in a row and then... Yeah. Yeah, that's the... Hi there, thanks for that fascinating talk. Uh, Peter Gay, Informal Democracy. Just the B word has been up around a little bit. So just a couple of kind of questions on, on Brexit, really. To what extent does the panel think that, what was Russia doing with Brexit? We've had a little bit about armed banks. There's been some stuff coming out about Facebook as it was going on, you know, Facebook activity ahead of Brexit. To what extent was that going on? Why are, in the UK are we so resistant to having that conversation about Russia and Brexit? And is there not a real danger that after Brexit, the kind of world that Oliver sketched out about Russia and Russian banking could actually become far more advanced uh, as, as Britain is kind of more isolated in need of, of kind of uh, in, uh, ex inter international uh, funds from, from other countries and the relationship between uh, Russia and the nexus of power and money in, in Britain could actually be more, more advanced and extreme than it is currently. Yeah, well, just very briefly, I think Russia played a big role in Brexit. It's something I've been investigating for The Guardian. I continue to investigate it. Um, and um, most people were on holiday, but we, we published a, 
documents from November 2015, which was a PowerPoint presentation given to Aaron Banks by the Russian ambassador, uh, uh, inviting him to invest in, in, uh, in, in gold, gold mines in Russia. And it literally was bars of gold, was the opening slide, and the Russian flag. Uh, so, I mean, KGB doesn't do subtle, they, they, do, they do very obvious. Um, and Aaron Banks took the meeting, he said he had one boozy lunch with the Russian ambassador, then it was two meetings, then it was three, uh, then to the New York Times recently he admitted four. And um, really what, what we know and what we can actually say without kind of troubling the lawyers is that there was a, there was a big uh, strategic Kremlin espionage operation to, to help politically and I think via a series of covert business deals leave EU and the Brexit campaign for obvious reasons because what the Kremlin wanted was Brexit because they knew, they calculated this would make the UK weaker economically, politically, um, uh, militarily and reduce it as a kind of international entity and enemy, bearing in mind that, that the UK is very much an enemy to Vladimir Putin. And we had, we, we had gold, um, Banks says he didn't take it, we then had offer of diamonds uh, in the spring of 2016 and then as late as May 2016 there was a second gold offer. Um, and if you saw Aaron Banks recently when he was grilled by the BBC about where his famous nine million pound donation to leave EU came from, and he just says, from my own resources. Um, and I think there were serious question marks about where precisely that money came from. Um, he won't say. He, he deals with these questions with a kind of postmodern smirk, uh, kind of, and, and lies about everything until he's sort of caught and then, then he concedes and then he moves on. Um, and it may be that actually Russian influence didn't make any difference and there wasn't Russian money, but what I'm amazed by, and I agree with your question, is why, um, Nobody, apart from perhaps people in this tent and a few people on the panel, is not jumping up and down about it. We have Robert Mueller in the States. We have a massive uh, intelligence FBI operation into how Russia subverted American democracy. And here, nothing at all. Uh, I think, was Brexit legitimate? I don't think so. Um, and I think we need to, to actually really get to the bottom of it. Aaron Banks is a great guy. <laughs> So on, on the question of the post-Brexit state of the UK, there is a, a battle in Whitehall at the moment between the Foreign, foreign Office on one side who, who want this sort of open free-for-all and DFID on the other side who really, really don't. So if you know anyone at DFID, you know, you know pat them on the back, shake them by the hand, Penny Morden MP, yay. Um, um, but it's pretty alarming to be honest because, yeah, um, you know, that this debate is even being had at all because, you know, we used to be a, a real leader in fighting corruption in this country and sadly that's really fallen away. Okay. Uh, the blonde lady over there, I believe it was. Thank you. I have a question for Zamina because um, uh, I'm Irena Taranyuk from Ukrainian Service at the BBC World Service, and this is our Ukrainian TV team. Uh, on an away day. <laughs> um, They're all spies. <laughs> were calling Antifa movement fascists. They call the whole country fascist, Ukraine. And today is Ukraine's Independence Day. That's why we are here, basically, to celebrate. Vladimir, I hope you're not watching. <laughs> Vladimir is a good guy, John. Yeah, I feel your pain. Because as BBC journalists, we are supposed to be balanced. So in reporting on what's going on in the East, we are not allowed to... We have to say that Russia denies all military involvement, even though we show Russia tanks and show Russian uh, soldiers. So that's the pain of uh, working for a democratic uh, institution like the BBC. But I have a question to Zemina. You know, I really voted for both. I wanted to hear Putin's um, secrets, family secrets too. So can you tell us what makes Putin tick to your, uh, in, in, in your learned opinion? And also a question to um, um, Luke. You know Russia intimately uh, and you know um, how the British um, media work. Do BBC uh, us as BBC stand a chance against uh, Russian information war and hybrid warfare. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for that. And um, um, whenever I speak um, to people from Ukraine, I first have to overcome this overwhelming sense of 
shame and guilt, although I haven't been living in Russia for the last 20 years. I don't associate myself with it. I'm not even ethnically Russian, uh, but just by association, by speaking with a Russian accent, you can't avoid it. I, I mean, and I'm sorry for everything that is happening in, in your country these days. Um, that's on emotional note, but um, to answer your fun question about uh, Putin, um, so a few things uh, that I don't think people know. His grandfather, uh, his paternal grandfather, uh, Spiridon uh, Putin, Spiridon Vladimirovich, I believe, Putin, is known and confirmed by historians uh, to be uh, a cook who cooked for Lenin, according to Putin, but to Lenin's uh, brother, rather, according to historians, and Stalin, according to Putin as well, uh, but according to the documents, more like to Stalin's resorts uh, at Dutchess in Moscow uh, uh, suburbs, where Stalin would arrive incognito. Uh, but even um, if he was there incognito, and even if it were just the people close to Stalin, you could imagine the level of trust that this person would have the connection with NKVD at the time that this person would have producing the food for uh, the leaders. And also I want to make a connection from here to Mr. Prigozhin, uh, who is called uh, Putin's cook, and who is known for mainly running the uh, troll factory in Ogina in St. Petersburg, and later on to maybe send in the mercenaries in Syria, as you would probably comment on better. So there is a certain uh, line there that you can follow. And um, uh, going from his grandfather to his father, um, it is known, and uh, Putin has confirmed it, that his father uh, was uh, serving in an KVD punitive uh, uh, department. Uh, it's called either the Fighter or Punitive Department, the Stribitelny Battalion and KVD, which is known to um, uh, for their repressions and basically shooting people in the in the rear, not on the front, but uh, and basically for its military crimes. Um, there is a rumor that I want to throw at you, and I was talking to John before about it. It is unconfirmed. You can follow up on it in a Polish magazine, Angora. There was a publication with the uh, photographs from the British closed archives uh, that supposedly uh, Putin's father, uh, after working for NKVD, a punitive uh, battalion, uh, worked with the Vlasov's battalions with uh, Yunukovych's father. This is unconfirmed. You can uh, research it. I had enough of Putin's family as it's going. Uh, however, Vlasov, I, by the way, Vlasov worked for the people with fought with the people who were on the losing side of the World War Two, the, the Nazis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the story is, it may not be true, that Putin's father was a part of Lasov's department, working on the Nazi side and collaborating with the Nazi. This is unconfirmed, that could be a complete rumor. I, I just, I'm offering to the colleagues to investigate on that, and I'm not saying that it's true. I just saw it in the Polish magazine as is. Could be completely fake. It's possible. It's uh, probably more than possible. Fake news. <laughs> Possible, yeah. So the, another thing that I did uh, find is that Putin is telling different versions of the stories about his mother um, during the siege. According to one of them, uh, which was a horrible event during which one and a half million people perished uh, from starvation, including my own family and uh, Putin's brother and his mother, who almost died. But according to one version, she was dragged out of the pile of corpses and recognized by her shoes by his father, who was back miraculously from the war at the time. And he told the story to Hillary Clinton at some dinner, and the American delegation was shocked. But for some other publications, he was telling a different version of the story. And so there are Russian correspondents who are comparing all these versions. And there is no one single story. So basically, being a KGB guy himself, following into his grandfather and into his father's steps, he's making up the myths and bending the reality to uh, his audience. 
in order to sell us the myth that symbolical thinking, mythological thinking, narrative thinking is incredibly important. And so one big story in which you see this ancestry, this generation, and the whole history of Russia. Uh, a very brief answer. Um, don't bend reality. Um, I, I think you do a great job. I, I think you need to kind of keep your nerve. Despite all the sledging, the propaganda, the accusations, uh, uh, stay calm and continue. And I hope at some point you will prevail and you're doing good stuff. Okay, so we've only got room for one more question, uh, be that lady over there. Um, before we do, I just wanted to say that, yeah, um, I think it's interesting that we had a uh, unconfirmed uh, rumor that's been in the press that we, we mentioned and said, you know, dig into it. That is the big difference between how journalism is done on this side of the avenue to how journalism is done on the other where what lies and misinformation are weaponized to spread dismay and confusion and i think it, t it takes uh confidence it takes courage to say hey look into this it it's probably not real it might not be real but i mean use your own critical thinking and that's the difference between democratic media as our co uh, colleagues and friends from the ukrainian service have said and uh, non-democratic media like russian state media disinformation is so uh, i'd like to pass over to our last last question and um thank you Hi, my name is Alice Stolmeyer. I'm from Defending Democracy. Uh, thank you for giving a great overview of the, let's say, the many problems and issues in the, the Putinesque landscape. Uh, maybe to end on a little, hopefully, brighter note, note um, what kind of solutions do you see? How do we address this? <laughs> Let's start on the end with Zarina again, work our way through, and then I'll, I'll wrap this things up. Time, let's start on the other end. Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah, we can do that. After you. Well, it, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. I mean, I, I'm tempted to say something flippant, like love each other. Um, but, but what I'll say instead is give us your money. Um, because I, I think what, what, what's needed is, is actually we need proper journalism. I mean, to follow up from, from Oz's point, we, we, we need to uh, sort of really almost by accident I think I think because the political class to some degree has failed it's sort of journalists and, and civic defenders um, uh, people like your organization who find ourselves on this kind of front line um, and um, we, we just need to kind of keep keep going keep reporting uh, and have good method I think we need to be empirical we absolutely have to be empirical and we have to be evidential and if we don't know something we have to say so and try and be kind of factual um, and struggle against this what we've been talking about today, this kind of weaponized post-modernity where we don't know what's true. Um, and so, you know, join, join, become a Guardian supporter. If you don't like the Guardian, buy the Telegraph, but just pay in some way for news or support organizations which you think are operating in that space, um, including the BBC, because, because we need your support and we need your cash. <laughs> Uh, I'm, um, uh, it's depressing because I, as I said, I've personally met people who are critical of Putin and they've been killed. And for the moment, it looks as though um, Putin's agenda is succeeding way more than one would have expected it to. However, um, as Churchill once said, there is hope um, uh, lying in the West. Who will release the PP tape first, the CIA <laughs> or the Cheka? Um, <laughs> I think if Trump's uh, problems continue, um, that's going to, uh, something interesting is going to happen, but it feels like, and this is depressing I'm afraid, it feels like with uh, Trump being increasingly self-conflicted, he's actually fallen out with his own lawyer. If that carries on, then Putin um, shortly will have the title of being the most powerful man on earth because Trump is in such a mess he can't actually so transparency, we must keep pushing for more transparency over who owns what and where the money is going. Um, and MPs and politicians that are still pushing this agenda, despite the fact it's fallen away a bit, need to be encouraged. So people like Margaret Hodge, um, shout out for her. She's been doing yeah, absolutely yeah. excellent yep. work. Yeah. And possibly interrogate the motives of people who are attacking her, perhaps. Just shout out Margaret Hodge, one love. <laughs> By the way, Margaret Hodge is not a great guy. <laughs> And finally, Zarina, over to you. Well, there are 
two parts to my question. One, um, I was in March at a conference uh, called PutinCon where Luke was delivering a very good uh, presentation. And there were a number of practical steps and solutions that I summed up and wrote down. There's an article uh, called Putin in the White House where all these concrete advice is written down one by one from all the leading experts from the world. And I really recommend everyone to go there and take a look because that includes what you suggest in freezing the assets and just very concrete steps, the best I've heard. On my side, I would say and add something else. Um, I think people in the West underestimate the importance of the asymmetric part of this assault. We need to start thinking differently the, the other part, the adversary, is investing into the mental part of their deal. And it's an intellectual game. They're well read, they're well thought, they are philosophizing it, and they are playing a sophisticated game. We here laughing it off sometimes, but we are either taking it seriously or not giving enough importance to the strategic thinking. We need to pull together all the resources that we have like I said before, all thinkers, all scientists, and come up together with a new way of thinking, with a new mentality. And that's why I think this uh, festival and this conference is so great, because it's pulling together th these resources and gives us a platform to converge and to have this discussion. So just last words, I'd like to thank uh, Zarina, Oliver, John, and Luke for, for, for coming here. Um, I like to say my own two cents on what we can do is uh, Russia Today UK operates with an Ofcom license. You know, we, we should be we should have got rid of that years ago. Um, and, and there are things that we can be doing, but we need to start fighting back. And the idea that we can just sit around and, and just, you know, get on with it, it's not working anymore. And we need to start taking Russian disinformation seriously. And we can only do that by fighting back and standing up to it. Follow us on Twitter, buy books, read our articles, and hopefully stay ahead of the game. Thanks very much for coming.